and welcome to this session about practical risk management. And talking with me, I'd like to welcome Kevin Fitzgerald, who's got an extensive career as an information security practitioner and consultant. So Kevin, thank you for joining us. Could you begin by giving some details of your background in the InfoSec field and how you started your career? Hi Steve. I was a commerce graduate in the early 60s. And by the end of the 60s, I was a, a computer manager of uh, what now would be a tiny computer, but in those days was a monster. I taught programming and system analysis and design. I saw the emphasis on productivity, not accuracy, and I turned my Master of Commerce thesis to that subject. I met a fairly famous at the time a researcher called Don Parker from Stanford Research Institute who wrote a very successful book called Crime by Computer in 1976, and he and I worked together establishing the Computer Abuse Research Bureau, collecting evidence on information, sorry, computer-related crime, and uh, huge publicity. had my own uh, radio show. I was on all the breakfast televisions, and I had my own column in the newspapers, all that sort of dream run into consultancy, as you can imagine. And by 1980, I launched my consultancy focusing on risk management continuity. It was called it was called the disaster recovery planning for computing in those days, and uh, security policies. And these are still the same subjects that I work with today around in Australia, <coughs> mainly in Melbourne, sometimes interstate. But now, of course, I understand after. 32 years in the business, I understand a lot more about this area, as you, these areas as you would expect. So at this stage of my life, I'm planning towards, working towards mentoring others. And my new mentoring website is soon to be launched, uh, offering risk policy and continuity techniques, all that I know about each of those uh, topics. So I've thoroughly enjoyed my life and I'm looking forward to the final stage of mentoring others. Okay, thanks Kevin. It certainly sounds like you're coming to us with a wealth of experience to share. So let's get us down to the main topic that we're going to talk about then of IT risk assessment. And let's start with why you think it's important and the ways in which it can be used to help the management of an organisation. Now threats have become harder to ignore over the years, mainly through the pressure of governance, risk and compliance, pressures on corporates and, and governments. Um, but risk management does go a long way. I've always found that uh, getting general management to understand their risk exposure profiles does lift a veil for them and they do understand that um, if they understand their risk profile then they've got the basics to build the business case to invest in mitigations. And when we do this and we create a risk management role in an organisation, risk management controls the risk register. That's what it does. The risk register registers all of the major risks and it monitors the progress of those risks in terms of the effectiveness of reducing risks. It should be a proactive process. In other words, risks should be looked at before they, they actually hit the organisation, but usually it's reactive. You'd think that waiting for social networking and mobile technology and cybercrime, you'd favoured being tackling that proactively, but I'm still finding that it's still reactively. Management is in a bit of a state of denial, I guess. I spoke to uh, the Australian Computer Society's um, monthly uh, meeting a couple of months ago now, and they were most concerned that uh, IT management were concerned that business management in general was definitely saying it won't happen here, it won't happen to me. They were in a state of denial. And threats need to be identified and realistically measured. Then there'll be a motivation to do something about them. And that's how I've approached my risk management area. OK, now if we look at the latest Information Security Breaches Survey from the UK, what it's suggesting now is that many organisations do feel they're paying attention to risk assessment in some way. And it says that 89% of large organisations and 74% of small ones are now reporting that they're doing it. Now these seem to be fairly significant percentages, so are there particular things that they ought to be bearing in mind in order to be doing it in a proper way? So, in relation to risk assessment, it must involve experienced operational management involved with the, with the assessment, rather than perhaps the auditors uh, making some estimates or some internal control people doing some estimates. It has to come down to the experiential situation where operational management, who have the experience of seeing and dealing with threats, 
we need to have them involved to make the observations and I've given them a means by which they can actually measure something about if it can't be ma measured it can't be managed and it seems to work over the years I've, I've done quite a number of hundred of these projects and you see the look in their eyes when they do understand what their risk profile really does look like. And so I like to have management, operational management involved, and I want them to be able to have a, a quantified assessment which creates the believability. A quantified assessment attacks likelihood and impact. Say the likelihood of an event would be, say, once every five years. And say that the impact, if it did occur, was going to be $25,000 then we're looking at $5,000 per annum as an annual risk exposure. And that, that quantified assessment really does ring a bell when you compare it with all the other threats that might be uh, present, and you can create a profile. If it's a qualified assessment, we talk about that high, medium and low likelihood and, and impact, it's just not as convincing. In my experience, risks are rarely assessed by experience management and are nearly always qualified assessments. And so the same power doesn't come into the, into the result of the project. OK, so that makes a good degree of sense in terms of having the evidence base to convince the audience. But how do you actually get the information to feed into that process? So you were talking about having things that talked about the likelihood of something happening within a given time frame and then the financial impact of that occurring. Where does that information come from? So how do we get concrete figures? Firstly, we talked about experienced operational managers. These have to be re recruited to go to a workshop. These days, workshops are pretty hard to get hold of because everyone's so busy. But by presenting the advantages, if people are able to give up the time to put their thoughts together, I usually run half a dozen workshops with the same, same group of people if I can. And together, we develop a threat asset matrix the threats are made up of the usual three, confidentiality, theft, uh, loss of information, integrity, errors and frauds, and availability, disasters and disruptions. And these are the columns of the matrix, confidentiality, integrity and availability. And of course that might be 20 columns long by the time you have your workshop to identify what the threats are. Then we look at the assets. And these make up the rows. And here we talk about things like office accommodation, databases, office equipment, paper files, websites, email, and a lot of these things occur when in the workshop. I go in with a blank sheet, a blank matrix, and I ask people to complete them for me because I want it to be their exercise, not me driving it. I want them to own the results of this. And so they create the matrix. And maybe they'll cross out rows and I'll cross out columns from time to time. But what we need to do then for all the cells, using approximations, and we have approximations for impact. For example, we might say you can choose between $100 million, $10 million, $1 million, $100,000, $10,000 or $1,000. And, of course, you're quite welcome to put in you know, $2 million rather than one or ten uh, to make it realistic if you do know what the, what the impact is. And the likelihood might be once every 100 years, once every 10 years, once every one year, 10 times a year, or 100 times a year. Errors are likely to be 100 times a year. Once every 100 years is a disaster occurring. So if you get the idea, we're able to be able to get these experienced people to put a figure on it and they will debate it and toss it around and argue and all the rest of it. But in the end, we'll be able to get a, a result for every cell in a matrix. So we create these annual risk exposures by combining the impact and the, the, the likelihood. So a $100 million impact and occurring once every 100 years is a million dollar per annum risk, risk exposure. Once you get that figure, those figures for every cell, add up all the columns, add up all the rows, put it on an Excel spreadsheet, sort it from highest value to lowest value. Very quickly, you sort out and get to understand where the major risks are and where they don't occur. And this is a five-minute uh, story on, on how to do this, but um, uh, just to give you the idea. Then you look at applying the mitigations. And my mitigations are all to do with prevent and detect, which a lot of the technical uh, people, that's what their solutions look like. But for my approach, I look at avoiding the threat, deterrence, in other words, putting policies in place and standards, 
with teeth, so you get a penalty if you do the wrong thing. Prevention, detection, true, we've got to have them. I want to train, especially for those errors, to make sure we don't get errors. Educate, maybe recruit better. I've got to recover from a point of view of disasters. We've got to ensure from a point of view of things going wrong. And there are also some threats which we will simply accept because it's not worthwhile doing anything about it. They're not serious enough. But a combination of that set of, that, of mitigations, and you might have others that pop up in the debates that occur, but a combination of them will end up getting us some acceptable solutions with a good chance of being able to produce a good result in the risk register over the years, uh, which I call a, a, a risk and mitigation management register. Okay, well that certainly gives us a process to follow, but I guess there's still potential for this to be enacted in ways that are more or less effective. So what do you consider a particular about the ways in which your approach is actually working here? So, as we said, management is in denial. In the current pace of change, how do you get the necessary buy-in? And my approach, taking first things first, is define the problem. That's my approach. The credo for my business is a problem well defined is a problem half solved. Not to rush into a solution without first confirming and realistic and measuring the exposure so that you can define the problem. We're not talking about high, medium or low type assessments, but I'm talking about annual risk exposures as I've talked about. My approach encourages proactive approaches to anticipate risk exposures as a result of having these judgments of experienced people and risk exposures per annum established. Now you mentioned there about that management in denial aspect, and I th certainly think there's some evidence that we can see of that over the years. So if we look at surveys over a period of time, there seems to be a definite lag between, say, new technologies and services being adopted and organisations that are using them having given a sufficient amount of attention towards protecting them and to ensure security-aware usage of them. So if we think about it, things like Wi-Fi, mobile devices, social networks, they'd all fall into this sort of category. So how do you get the necessary buy-in and get attention focused towards these things in the right way? Usually risk management is applied after the occurrence of a risk and I'm encouraging people to me to be proactive. The focus on after the event is an approach which really does ask for trouble and the evidence comes from having experienced shop floor type people arguing and, and developing strong ideas about the sort of things that we're wrestling with in terms of whether it's a major or a minor type issue, whether it's a major value or whether it can be just called inconsequential. And this is the sort of stuff that I'm taking these days to get organisations to try to evaluate the damage as well as the advantages that social networking brings similar for mobile technology, work anywhere, anytime type philosophies about work. Okay, well it's certainly difficult to dispute the logic of taking a proactive approach on this where possible. So can you give us some more insight into the actual workings of your methodology to see how some of this would actually function in practice? The next example is there for you to see and looking at that slide you can see the threats the confidentiality, integrity and availability issues. Distributed denial of service is, uh, is the last column, just in case you didn't know what that was. I know you will see, but um, assets I've got uh, down the side there, and I hope you can read the writing on the slide, but in each cell we actually work out what the, prob the, the, the uh, likelihood would be, I almost said probability, and we don't want to be that accurate, the big probability, likelihood seems to be a more understandable term. So it's an approximation, uh, and you'll see we have all sorts of numbers in there. Some of those numbers represent figures which people actually have uh, seen and measured in reality in the past, and we end up with per annum figures which make the, uh, the, the totals. Now, when we press the go button, and we sort the matrix on the next slide, you'll see distributed denial of service which was, on the far right hand side, is now the number one because it has the highest total annual risk exposure, that's ARE. So uh, there you, you can see, I'll put them in red, the things that perhaps we should be spending, spending most time on. You'll see that there will also be some cells don't get uh, assessed because they're not applicable or it's inconsequential. 
or it's covered in an earlier row or column. So we, we use common sense in relation to what we get. So having got the information sorted in this way, how do you then go on to use it for the benefit of protection? And are there any pitfalls to look out for here in terms of prioritising the types of protection that are going to be most effective in combating the risks that you're facing? When it comes to uh, applying mitigations, there is uh, the list there that the, the ones that avoid, deter, train, educate, prevent, detect, recover, ensure, accept, Normally we see a strong, strong emphasis towards prevent and detect. And one of the things that, that I've come to know over the years is that people are one of the biggest dangers to information, employees, managers, people. And if we can put some teeth into the deterrence, so we have policies and standards and guidelines, and if you don't obey those rules, there'll be some penalty, three shots and you're out sort of thing. That deterrence is a very important thing because it does, more than anything else, it can change the culture, the security culture of an organisation if you have effective policies and standards. And you also train and educate and perhaps recruit people more effectively than you have in the past to get this change in culture. And obviously there are, there are other issues there with other, other approaches there to recover, ensure or accept. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So the risk uh, for us is established by the Risk Management Committee or some like body in a Risk and Mitigation Management Register. And you'll see that on that slide, the, the risk and the risk characteristic, for instance, might be a theft of a laptop. And we might say, and you will write into here the characteristics, which we twice every year, uh, and the impact would be $5,000. So giving you a, a $10,000 per annum risk exposure. And uh, the date that is identified, of course, the mitigation and responsibi responsibility, uh, the mitigation is policy standards with penalties. And maybe we could consider encryption would be the, uh, the mitigation and the responsibility, someone will be given a responsibility to implement those mitigations and the date that the mitigations were installed and some comment on the effectiveness. In this case of theft of laptops, it might say there's only one laptop has been lost in the last 12 months. Um, that gives you a, a bit of a record so that monthly risk management meetings can address these things very directly and you can measure and manage in that area. Okay, Kevin, that's an interesting guide through the process there. One thing I'd like to go back to, though, is this underlying premise of approximation. How can we actually rely upon that as a sufficient basis for addressing our risk? Well, that's a good question, but note the following. The risk approximation is debated by experienced hands-on managers. They debate each cell of the matrix, and they operate at an operational level in my workshops, no one's allowed to sit there and say nothing, and we must get every thought on the table that we can before we move on. So I need to have decisions that are supported by experience. Uh, someone once said it's better to be approximately correct than precisely wrong, and using approximation tables for the impact and the likelihood, it can be done fairly quickly. Does this work equally well for all of the different types of impact that you might be wanting to consider? So, so for example, how about some of the more intangible things, such as uh, damage to reputation, loss of image, etc.? It takes a little longer to debate those, and sometimes organisations that I've worked with have, have given uh, an index to use, to use and say that uh, the damage to reputation were reflected in uh, loss of uh, share price or uh, loss of market share, and so that can be significant numbers, and they'll work out a, a rating scale. So if you gave a loss of reputation a rating of, of two, that might equal uh, $4 million or some such way of doing it. But very often people have come up with those sort of ideas to try to get what I call a practical reality view of each threat. And it's been my experience that management does understand and is very comfortable working with annual risk exposures because they are measurements and they, can re they come from people that they trust. Okay, that's a useful clarification. Thank you. All right, so where do we go from here? What's next? What, what happens at the next stage of the process? So the outcomes. Risk exposure profiles 
are clearly expressed as risk exposures and asset vulnerabilities. For some, for senior management's understanding and based on experienced input from operational management, all these things add up to something that is believable. The mitigation sets apply to risks, exposures and vulnerability totals in each uh, column and row, vulnerability for assets, and these shine a light on what's worthwhile protecting and, and how much effort you should put into it and how much money you should spend on it. And the variety of controls that we put in means that some of those controls aren't always that expensive. The risk register has got to be regularly used and maintained, else it loses its value to management, and identifies the effective controls and the ineffective controls. So you may need to change the sort of things that you thought would control a particular threat and put in something else. So the credibility of the outcome is based upon the workshop participants, the quality of the control mixes, you avoid the turpentine and detect type stuff, and it encourages, this approach encourages controls not only to be technical controls, but also to come from personnel behaviours and physical controls. And uh, when you put the whole thing together, credibility comes out in that risk register displaying the annual risk exposure reductions. I'd like to take the opportunity to delve into a little bit more detail around the process again, if we can here. Um, can you tell us more about how you arrive at the appropriate mitigations? I want to show you this uh, risk scatter diagram. <clears throat> it's an interesting uh, diagram to try to get uh, the mitigation strategies into place. Obviously, for even core tiles, some organisations have different risk tolerances and may change those core tiles from being even to be skewed in some way or another, but let's, not, let's treat it simply for the start. The x-axis along the bottom is the likelihood, and the impact is the, the vertical axis. In the top left-hand corner, we have high impact and low likelihoods. And if you think of what would be likely to, to represent here, a high impact and low likelihood, something that happens costing millions of dollars but doesn't occur very often, is probably going to be an earthquake or a tornado, or maybe not a tornado in some, organ, some areas, of course, but it, it would be something very rare, a major fire. And what we've got to do there, the, the strategy that sits out at us there is in that situation you want to reduce the impact, if you can, by recovering and insuring against it. And if we go diagonally opposite to reverse that, where you've got low impact and high likelihood, low impact meaning it won't cost very much, and high likelihood means it happens every day, will be things like errors and omissions, or as that example says, a laptop theft. It might be that it is a low impact, but it happens quite often, some organisations it does. If you go then to the top right-hand quartile, high impact and high likelihood, if you have any examples that sit in that quartile, that's got to be an avoidance strategy. You want to get out of that business or change the way you're doing things if that's going to happen. And surprisingly, often I get people with examples of that. And it's always a, a great thing for them to understand that they've got to make some quick action about that, and that's the fastest one that we get fixed. And if we go down to the other side, the bottom left-hand corner, where we're talking about low impact and low likelihood, that's where you can accept that situation. You may want to do nothing about it or make minor investments there, but usually people are very happy to forget about to accept the threats that fit in that quarter aisle and are very happy to take instant action for those things that are in the opposite diagonal with high impact and high likelihood. The ones that cause us most of the bother are ones that are around the centre as we're trying to work out just how we'll do it. But you can see that that's a boardroom type illustration where you get your matrix and you place every cell in a position that refers to the values on the axes of that, of that uh, scatter diagram. And it's, it's a real eye-opener for, for management to see how well it sits together. Okay, thank you, Kevin. You've given us a really good overview of the process now. Um, I'd like to just double back, really, and you mentioned earlier on in the discussion your extensive experience, what was it, 32 years in the business. Um, can you give us an overall reflection on the sort of problems that you think are, are prominent? 
first thing that, that springs to mind is, is not an individual thing, but it's a general statement, is that the IT shops are rushing into solution mode. IT is about solutions, and it doesn't take time to really understand the problem. In my experience, I've often come across that situation where a solution is in place, but it, it's really a bit of window dressing because it really doesn't stop people doing the wrong thing. We need to be careful that we firstly define the problem. Also, another ob observation is management dismissing all non-technical solutions, saying that the only way we're going to fix this is by a technical solution. And often it is that personnel are themselves the major threat. Just think about passwords and how poorly used they are in most organisations. Policies and standards exist in some organisations. Surprisingly, they don't exist in lots of organisations. In my experiences, certainly the smaller organisations never, never do worry about policies and standards. But those that have got them very often do not have effective penalties. It's all very well to be nice to people, but one of my first mentors from the Ford Squad said to me, in every organisation, Kevin, 70% of the people are honest. We all know those. 10% of the people are dishonest. And we all know those. Well, we think we identify them. 20% of the people, well, it just depends on the situation. And they're the people that you've got to try to control. Because if you can get them to obey policies and standards because of penalties, you can get rid of one of the major weaknesses in most organisations. Also, the absence of police checks. I've been involved with situations where sensitive positions have never been police checked and we've found a person's a gambler or has been up on drug charges. Those sort of things are, are things that should happen and that, that sort of means that you've got to understand what are the sensitive positions. Another one is not enforcing annual holidays. The person who never leaves an organisation has got a black cloud over it, according to my police people. There's a lot of hush-hush about data leakage. No, leakage. no one wants to talk about it or even admit it that it's happening. It doesn't matter because information that's stolen is still not missing. We haven't really lost it. We don't know where it's gone. It's probably not going to be used against us. But there's a lot of chances these days for information to walk out the door in an iPad or an iPhone. Surprisingly, information classification and handling procedures are just one big blind spot. Most organisations don't classify information, and those that do don't have handling procedures. It really is a frustration for me that people don't do that basic, basic thing to respect the information that they've got. I mean, 90% of organisation is public information, but you need to understand what that 10% of valuable information is. It's your absolutely where the diamonds are. Yes, yeah, so that's a really valid point. I couldn't agree more on that one. Now, we're coming towards the end of the session, but what, I want to go back to another thing that you said right at the start. You, you mentioned that now what you're doing is focusing on mentoring others to support their security. Can you tell us a bit more about that and how it works? So, a slide there on my uh, mentoring website. I'm sharing everything about my marketing edge. It's kept me alive for the last 32 years. Right from uh, winning the right to write the proposal, writing it, selecting workshop participants, conducting it, writing reports, and so on. All, uh, everything I know in a major piece of work that took me about six months to uh, put together in relation to the risk areas. Well, thank you, Kevin. I certainly wish you well with that, and I look forward to speaking to you again in the near future. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, listeners.